when it comes to holy tradition, there are separate yet united traditions or parts that make up the whole, varying in degrees of authority. For example, scripture, ecumenical councils, church music, and art. Would you gentlemen say all these are inspired? And th th these two words is what I'm focusing on, really. Inspired and inerrant sources of authority. Or is that even terminology that we would even use in the first place? And Father John, I'll kick that over to you first. Um, what, what do you think about inerrant and inspired? Well, I think when we talk about tradition, we have to make some distinctions because we use the word in different senses. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times you hear people talk about big T traditions and little T traditions. But yeah. I think that that could be misleading because sometimes people will say, well, that's just a little T tradition. And they're just it's just because they don't like it. <laughs> but uh when we're talking about apostolic tradition, these are the traditions that the church received from the apostles, which they were taught by Christ. And so there's no doubt about the fact that apostolic tradition would be authoritative and inerrant. Mm -hmm. But there's another kind of tradition which is also authoritative and inerrant as well. And we would say ecclesiastical tradition, the sense of things that are universally affirmed by the church. So that would be especially uh, things that are uh, decreed by ecumenical councils or councils or fathers that the ecumenical councils affirmed. Mm -hmm. And um, so not everything in an ecumenical council would necessarily have been an apostolic tradition. So for example, um, we know that there were married bishops in the early church. We know that St. Peter had a wife, for example. Right. Um, but as the church went through uh, its history very early on. You had bishops who were married, whose wives would be made deaconesses or they would become nuns. And uh, it was it, because there was an understanding before it became a decree that being a bishop and being a married man raising children was not something that worked together very well. And so then eventually it became an established um, standard that to be a bishop, you had to be a monastic. Mm -hmm. And so so we don't have married bishops today, at least not bishops that are currently married. We have mm -hmm. bishops who have, have been married. Usually their wives have, have uh, reposed when they're when they're made a bishop. Sure. And, but we wouldn't say that's an apostolic tradition, but it's an ecclesiastical tradition that the church as a whole has affirmed. Um, then you could also talk about, um, traditions that may or may not be true. For example, um, you know, there's a tradition that, uh, St. Joseph of Arimathea went to England with the, with Christ when he was a young man. And, uh, that you have lots of traditions related to that. For example, the Glastonbury thorn is supposed to have originated from him having, stuck his staff into the ground and then it sprouted okay. well it's a that's a a cool tradition and yeah. you know it, it'd be you know i have no objections to it being true but i would not say that that's something that is infallibly true or that everybody ha would have to affirm to be true because it may be true but it may not be true it's it's a tradition mm -hmm. and then there are also local traditions so you could talk about the fact that for example in the russian church when people take communion they'll kiss the chalice after they take communion. But in the Greek church, they don't kiss the chalice after they take communion. And they actually both, both practices have the same rationale, behind it, which is respect for the Eucharist. But the Russians kiss the chalice, which is what clergy do actually after they kiss the chalice. Mm -hmm. I mean, after they take communion in the altar, even Greek clergy do that. Okay. Um, so they're showing their respect for the, the, the mm -hmm. Eucharist. But in Greek practice, they don't kiss the chalice because there's a concern where you might get some mis some of the mysteries on the outside of the chalice. And uh, and so it's but those are those neither one of those you would say, well, if you don't agree with that, you're you're a heretic or anything like that. It's, it's a local custom. And there are even local customs within a parish, you know, that in our parish we do this. Mm -hmm. But obviously it's not a universal tradition of the church. So these have varying degrees of authority. And if you talk about iconography, for example, there are certain kinds, there's something about iconography that you could say, well, this is universally 
the practice of the church mm-hmm. because there are some icon icons that there's no disputes about but on the other hand there's you know icons that don't have long histories that some people would say well that shouldn't be painted that way and other people would say yeah it's fine uh so it depends you know and uh, and in terms of like the hymnody of the church i would say hymns that the whole church uses uh mm-hmm. you'd you you would at least have to say that there's no doctrinal error in those hymns there might be historical errors for example because maybe uh you know there might be a hymn that talks about a saint and says something that may not be precisely uh, true of history or something like that but but the church as a whole certainly would not be using hymns that were expressing heretical teachings right and 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 so so varying degrees of authority depending on which type of tradition we're talking about okay would would one of the the traditions like that also because i know in and so i i say this thinking back on the conversation that I had with Craig Trulia uh, about different traditions and things like that. And he sounded surprised, and I can't remember which parish he mentioned by name, but he said that I think it was during, and and I know one of y'all guys can help me out. Jeremy, I know you could help me out with this one. Uh, but where we read different, uh, in different languages, I think it's John chapter 20, verses 19 through 25. In our parish, we read them like in ah, it's a lot of different languages and craig seemed kind of surprised by that so do all parishes do that kind of thing or, or not so much that's actually a greek practice uh, okay but the the russian practice is actually on pascha night when you're when you read the at the at the liturgy mm-hmm. when you read the gospel of john which is the first chapter of john i think it's like the first 18 verses or something like that okay that's read in many languages Gotcha. The Greeks uh, and and I and the th- one thing about the difference between Greek and Russian practice is usually when there's a difference, the Russians are doing it the way that the Greeks that evangelized the Russians taught them to do it. So the Russians often are preserving an older Greek practice, but I suspect that the practice of reading the gospel that's done at the Agape Vespers in many languages probably originated from the fact that if you do, if you read the gospel in many languages at the liturgy that's in the wee hours of the morning, you're just making the service that much longer. (laughs) (laughs) Whereas the following day when people have had a chance to get some rest, (laughs) to read that gospel in many languages is is a lot easier uh, to, to, to handle. Although, Obviously, the gospel reading that you read at the liturgy on Pascha is one that is like, this is a powerful gospel talking about sure. the incarnation of Christ. And to read that in many languages probably makes most sense, mm-hmm. uh, you know, liturgically. So I, I do think the Russian practice is probably the older practice, but there's a practical reason, I think, for the uh, for the Greek practice. Okay, fair enough, fair enough. All right, I want to kick this over to Father Joseph and get his uh, get his views on, on this first question as well. Uh, Father Joseph, I can repeat the question if you want me to, but I'm really concerned, and, and because this is a conversation that has came up between co-hosts on this show, specifically between me and my co-host Dale, and he makes like this, basically, and I know he might be watching, I haven't seen him comment in the in the live chat, but I think, and he can correct me if I'm wrong later, and then I can maybe ask you in private or, or if we're not on this episode, uh, ask you then. But he seems to have this idea that it's either all, all tra- everything that Orthodox Christians would consider tradition, uh, whether it's big T, little t, or however we would phrase that, is, has to be inerrant specifically or quote-unquote inspired. And I know we use the term inspired, so I guess I'm more focused on inerrant. Um, wh- what are your thoughts about that? It's a great question. It's a very logical one. I mean, <clears throat> of course, you know, when we look at dogma, you know, the central truths of the faith, like the, the death, the resurrection, the deity of Christ, um, you know, we don't merely see patristic consensus. We see patristic unanimity. You know, you're not going to find any saint denying the deity of Christ. You're not going to find any saint denying that he died and rose again. And um, it would be easy to assume, as many people do, that we think, well, since 
uh, you know, the consensus of the saints gets the big questions right, then, you know, if we trust in what they say about the dogmas, then shouldn't they get, get everything right? You know, shouldn't the saints get every minor historical detail, every small T tradition, you know, every, uh, <clears throat> every little detail about history or science correct? And, <clears throat> and the fact is that's not the case. And, but it's important to understand why that's not the case. And, you know, we could go into, we could have a whole show just on that one question. You know, we could go as deep as we want just on that one question. Sure. But just a broad, just a broad view of it. Um, you know, if you deny the deity of Christ, you're going to be excommunicated. <laughs> you're going to be thrown out of the church. Yeah. Uh, you're definitely not going to be canonized as a saint. <laughs> Um, so there's a filter and, and it's not just a human filter. You know, Christ gave a, a promise. He gave, he, he said, um, you know, on this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Yeah. So if, if the entire church, which, you know, we're going to define that as the saints, which we, as we said, we would save that topic for another show. But once we figure out who the saints are, um, they're not going to defect. You know, you're, you're never going to look at the saints and say, huh, you know what? Some of them think Jesus is not God. Some of them think that, uh, that he didn't die and rise again. Um, because if the saints defect, if the church uh, takes on dogmatic error, it's not the church anymore. The gates of hell have prevailed. Uh, but now let's take one of these, you know, small T traditions, you know, uh, some, you know, relatively minor historical point. Uh, one of my favorites to talk about is just, I find it interesting, is, you know, in First Kingdoms or in some Bibles, the you know, book of First Samuel, chapter 28, you have uh, the witch of Endor uh, calls up the spirit of the prophet Samuel after he's already died, uh, because King Saul wants a word from the prophet, you know, to tell him what's going to happen. And we see in the text of scripture that, you know, there's this apparition, this voice of some sort. And, and so there was a great controversy over that. You know, you, we talk about the consensus of the saints, but on this particular topic, the saints were, were all over the map. You have, uh, you know, three different views out there. Uh, you know, some of the saints just took it at face value. You and they said um, that you know this woman actually called Samuel forth from the dead, and he and he you know and he he came and gave a message. So this would be you know, like Justin Martyr, Ambrose, Augustine. Uh, you have another group of saints, including John Chrysostom and Theodoret, saying that you know whether it was Samuel or whether it was a demon, um, the spirit of Samuel. We don't know whether that spirit was Samuel or whether it was just a demon impersonating him, but it appeared at God's bidding and not by some bidding of the woman. And then you have a third group of saints, which is the biggest, saying that it was not Samuel at all. It was a demon who deceived Saul and gave him a false prophecy. And you know this group would include Hippolytus, Ephraim the Syrian, Evagrius, Basil, Jerome, Ambrosiaster, Gregory of Nyssa. And... Um, you know, so just on the face of it, you say, first of all, you know, they're all over the map. Um, well, you know, how could that be? How could they be all over the map on something? Well, how important is this? You know, if, what if you, what are the stakes if you get this wrong? If you say, uh, I think, I think it's for real. I think that the witch of Indoor actually called up his spirit from the dead and you're wrong. It was a demon. Well, you know. You, you, you'll get corrected whenever you get to heaven, but you're not going to be barred entry to heaven because you miss that, uh, you know, that uh, question on the test. Right. Likewise, what if you say, you know what, I'm going to go with the majority of the saints on this one. You know, I think that this was not real. I think once, you know, once you're dead, you know, you know, we look in Luke 16 and there's this great chasm between, you know, one side and the other side and, and surely they can't have come to earth. So, um, 
So yeah, I'm just going to say that was a demon. It was not actually Samuel. It was a demon that was impersonating him. Mm -hmm. Well, if I turn out to be wrong, again, you know, Samuel's going to walk up to me in heaven and say, hey, dude, that was me. That wasn't no demon. <laughs> right. Uh, but you're not going to be barred entry into heaven because of that. So, you know, just by the very nature of it, the tiniest historical details, the most insignificant questions, uh, you can be wrong on it, and it does not affect your standing in the church. You're not going to be filtered out. You're not going to be excommunicated or thrown out or have, you know, masses of people, uh, you know, cursing you because you're a false teacher. Now, those are the two extremes. Those are the two bookends. You know, the deity of Christ sure. is at one extreme. The saints are unanimous on that. Uh, whether this spirit was actually Samuel or not is at the other extreme. It's interesting, and it has some importance, and I would rather get it right than get it wrong, but mm -hmm. you can get it wrong all day long. A hundred saints could get it wrong all day long, all day long, and it's not going to make them false teachers. It's not going to bar them entry to heaven. So there's room in the church for error on small things, and I thank God for that. Otherwise, I would never make it to heaven ever right. uh, uh you know there there is room for error it doesn't mean that we embrace it or that we want it or that we look for it it just means uh you don't have to be right about everything and and on the and on this particular minor point about you know was it samuel was it a demon uh, i think we can actually solve that problem in a very simple way that i wish the saints had thought of but they didn't and and that's uh, this particular question is actually answered in a different part of scripture. And so, and it's just kind of, uh, it's just interesting, but if you go to the book of Sirach mm -hmm. in the Old Testament, chapter 46, it actually answers the question. It says, um, before the time of his eternal sleep, Samuel bore witness before the Lord. And then a uh, verse later, it says, even after he had fallen asleep, he prophesied and made known to the king his death and lifted up his voice from the ground in prophecy oh. to blot out the lawlessness of the people. So you have a really explicit statement from a passage of scripture in the Old Testament that's not very widely known, you know, are not familiar with that right. particular verse. And apparently, uh, you know, the particular saints that were opposed to this idea were not familiar with that one verse. And it's one of the cases, this doesn't always work, but it's one of the cases where you can actually find a source that will kind of clear everything up for you. And you can say, okay, now I know which, you know, I know which side to pick, yeah. but I don't feel any worse about that list of saints that happened to get it wrong uh, because it's not a core, you know, it's not a core doctrine that's going, you know, that the faith stands or falls on. And where things get hairy, where things get fuzzy is the muddle in the middle. <laughs> Uh, yeah. The doctrines that are really important, the things that we care about, the things that if you get wrong, it can mess with your life. But you wouldn't quite call them dogma either. You know, they're, they're not. There's something that you don't want to get wrong. But even if you get it wrong, you're not going to. You know, you're not going to be cast out of heaven for it. So, and I'm sure we'll get into more of those details as we go farther into the show. But hopefully, that answers that particular objection that. You know, if, if we're considering them an authority on these great truths, that we therefore must consider them infallible in all things, and that just that's just not uh, that's just not the case. Do 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 do. Come check out our Faith Unaltered show. Do 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 do.